his latest book, Trump vs. China, Facing America's Greatest Threat, former U.S. House Speaker Newt Gingrich argued that most of America's problems are not China's fault, but its own. What's the nature of the problems he's talking about? Why is he pointing out that the U.S., rather than China, is responsible for them? And will this make any difference in China-U.S. relations? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Zhang Gong from the University of International Business and Economics and Anna Tangan, a regular commentator. We shall also speak to Richard Wise, a security expert at the um, Weak Strat Global Consultancy via satellite from Washington, D.C. That's our topic. This is the dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to Dialogue. Zhang and Anna, do you think uh, what Newt Gingrich, the former House Speaker, said in his book concerning China was actually very satirical? Mm -hmm. What he meant was uh, that it is the United States and the previous administrations of the U.S. Uh, who should be held responsible for letting China become a, exactly. an alleged threat to U.S. national security. Do you think this is true? Absolutely. This is absolutely true. Uh, I think uh, what he says that U.S. is at fault, by that he means that the uh, United States has been underestimating China. The United States shouldn't have believed in the kind of a story that was pitched, for example, by President Clinton uh, to the to Congress when China was, join, was trying to join WTO. Uh, he listed all these things, uh, starting from uh, the era of Deng Xiaoping, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, talking about his wearing a hair, uh, cowboy hat in, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and according to him, this is all a sort of a, a, a deception. Uh, it is something that China has a long-term strategic plan to uh, fool the United States and to, uh, 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 and to catch up and dominate the world. I mean, this is the story pretty much promulgated by Phyllis Murray. I mean, there's nothing new here uh, other than he's just trying to sensationalize things, uh, trying to uh, attract some attention. Uh, I think what he said has been, uh, it's already been said before, there's really nothing sort of new here, but uh, the way he talks about this, the way he sensationalizes... Just, how do you translate uh, Deng Xiaoping's words like uh, Tao Guang Yang Hui? Because this kind um, of uh, rhetoric <coughs> may somehow conform with the conspiracy theory that some of the American policymakers, such as uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, yeah. held so dear. Well, I would translate it as keeping a low profile, I guess, in, in uh, diplomatic that sounds relations. not so sensational, uh, not yeah, up to I, the taste of it. I, th talks, right? I, think that's, <laughs> I think that statement uh, is very fair. I mean, it's, it, it, it fits with China's uh, national power uh, at that uh, time, right? Exactly. <laughs> there was no national power. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, it, exactly. China had no money, right? And they had no technology, they had no IP, nothing. Uh, they didn't have a, a banking system, a legal system, anything that would compete with the West. Yet, this is the real issue, is that China, without anything, was able to compete and succeed using an alternative system than uh, uh, you know, what American exceptionalism demands, that it be democratic, liber liberal democratic uh, capitalism. So this is the real essence of what uh, Newt Gingrich is trying to say. But what, what I found most interesting is that in the process of saying it, he's, he does lay blame squarely on you know, the, the, the hands of those in government previously and, coincidentally, on Donald Trump, in essence. Because he's, he's basically saying that, you know, here, here are all the things that we didn't do. We didn't uh, train our people. We didn't pay our corporations, pay no attention over the last five years to 5G. You know, this is not China's fault. And they're absolutely correct in that. The question I have, and, I, you know, we were discussing this earlier, why is he saying it? He's a 74-year-old man. Uh, he held power. He fell in great disgrace. Um, what is his game plan? He's a very strategic guy. This is the man who said contract with America. Uh, he yeah. created this kind of populist uh, back and forth that is a precursor to where Donald Trump is today. Um, but it's just not cl clear where he's going. Clearly he has his own political agenda and a political ambition, uh, if not in competition with uh, Mike Pence, the current uh, vice president of the uh, Trump administration. But uh, my next question is very much about why Newt Gingrich focused on the issue of 5G and Huawei. He also talked about uh, 
the importance of uh, alienating Chinese students in areas of science right. education in the United States uh, since one year ago? Well, I think Huawei is a very good story. Huawei is uh, essentially the poster child of China's corporate success on international stage. It uh, epitomizes the, the model, you know, the model of Chinese companies competing uh, fiercely on the international market, investing in R&D. Um, actually, Huawei is not getting much support from the Chinese government, in my opinion. But nevertheless, it's a been incredibly successful story. And I think another reason for picking up Huawei is that <coughs> um, in the telecommunication area, um, the loss and total failure, you know, I, would, I would use with fiasco of uh, the, these American companies, Lucent included, Motorola included, uh, has been a spectacular uh, uh, story of you know, how America has lost its edge in, in you know, technology, technological competition. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that you know, strikes to the very heart of American people. Uh, it's uh, you know used to be the case that America, America is so powerful in this area. Telephone was invented by AT&T. Bell Labs was the you know a pyramid of uh, industrial laboratories uh, during those days, and all of these are gone now. Uh, now it you have might a be a little bit too early to say the heyday of American uh, scientific advantages. No, but, uh, well, I'm going to agree, yeah. agree with John in this one in the sense that look, Donald Trump didn't hasn't turned around to the American people and corporations and said we need to be better than we are. What he said is, we're going to trip up the Chinese, and while they're when they're falling down, we'll race ahead. This this is the kind of approach that he's taken. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go back to John Kennedy when Sputnik came forward. He said, mm -hmm. you know, we are going to be the Russians, and we're going to train our people. We're going to talk. He talked about education, everything that was necessary, STEM, all of these things. Mm -hmm. When have you heard Donald Trump come forward with this plan for the future? Yeah, but for. For many governments, in the process of nation making, they have mm -hmm. always developed a strong sense of a crisis or mm -hmm. an awareness about right. a crisis. In the case of Japan, which is right. an island country, even at the height of the Cold War, mm -hmm. when you look at the strategic rivalries between the United States and the former Soviet Union right. and their competitions in the outer space, right. Apollo landing in the moon and uh, of course the astronauts, the first the Soviet astronauts walking into the space. So right. that has caused a lot of uh, early warnings from the U.S. media, a lot right. of media fanfare. Do you think uh, Americans are repeating the same sense of the hysteria and they, what they do is to cause Right. consternation and to raise an early alarm. Well, I uh, think that could be a self-fulfilling problem. Yeah, well, I think these politicians, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich included, are indeed invoking this episode on the Sputnik moment you talk about. I think, you know, using the telecom industry is a, is a good example to illustrate this point. But uh, let me put it this way, okay. Even though Motorola and Lucent have really failed in competing with these Chinese companies in the telecom, you know, carrier equipment company, America hasn't really failed, in my opinion, in this area overall. For example, example, in upstream, in the chip making industries, uh, you know, Qualcomm, Skyworks, Quova, these companies are still very dominant, right? Uh, in the handset business, Apple was in this business 20 years ago. It came from nowhere and dominated the handset business. So I think America, corporate America's vitality, its vigorous you know, pursuit of technology, its entrepreneurship is still there. It hasn't really failed. It's just, you know, in the, in the telecom but, but, equipment but John, market, John, it is failing. But in other fields, I think uh, it's, it's been quite John, successful. Look, today they announced that Huawei is producing two of its most popular phones without one single piece of American uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. Software, yes, they're still using. Uh, 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 Google and things like the Android, but the fact that China within a and everyone is surprised by this how quickly they were able to replace all of the parts that were in there. But this is not and always I, phone choosing. I mean, it's not choosing. This, this is all point, thanks to uh, but to my, Donald no, Trump. No, exactly. Why we would rather buy these products from from Qualcomm from not maybe they want to buy it cheapest, but, but from from yeah. Skyworks from Qualcomm. I mean, these companies they they love to have these contracts with these companies. I know, but this <laughs> is what my point is that. Who, what is failing America right now are its politicians, because once that I you can, once you don't need to go to the U.S. and you can't rely on the U.S., you will stop buying, and this means that our companies, 60% of Qualcomm's revenues come from where? China, Asia. All right. If they're cut off from this, where does Qualcomm go? Then take on the add-on effect. Since you don't have money and you're not selling anything, you're not putting anything into R&D. And at it that is, point, it, you're it's not that uh, previously so many governments in uh, in the West that have developed uh, a sense of a crisis. So in fact, the uh, president uh, of Huawei, Mr. Jin Zhengfei, is a man of vision. He has uh, 
uh, been well prepared for a kind of a showdown or uh, sanctions from the United States by developing its own alternative operating system. Let me cross over to Richard, who's standing by in Washington, and uh, let's uh, have his uh, insight or analysis about why Mr. Newt Gingrich uh, spent so much time uh, writing and dwelling upon the alleged China threat. What are your thoughts, Richard? Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the conversation, but actually uh, Gingrich was asked that question on an interview on TV, and he said it came, he's always been interested in China, but particularly it was when he visited China a few years ago and was struck by how different his conceptions, he was with his family, and the conceptions of the Chinese he was buying things from and working with were. He said he was struck by, you know, he was focused on results, the Chinese were focused on process, um, and, and there were a bunch of differences that triggered in his mind the fact that many of the challenges facing the China-U.S. relationship may be due to misconceptions about how one's country and society views the other. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, let's uh, uh, keep our eyes or set eyes to continental Europe uh, uh, even before the Brexit happens. Uh, John and Anna, Richard, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel called on European governments to uh, form a united front against China and on the issue of Huawei. Do you think that somehow showcases the growing divisions, if any? between and among member states of the European Union. They have failed, in other words, to establish a consensus about China. Uh, you look at the investment in Greece uh, mm -hmm. and the Italian approach to sign up to BRI memorandum to see nothing of the mechanism of 17 plus 1 in Eastern and Central Europe. And that may have somehow, somehow caused worries from Brussels. What do you think of the uh, sense of alarm from uh, this outgoing German chancellor? Well, I won't characterize this uh, unified policy against China. I would say towards China. I don't think uh, he's against Huawei. I think German government probably would like to do something very similar to the UK government. You know, where it's, uh, you know, look at its uh, products, look at its uh, the source codes and, and deploy the equipment on a quite limited scale. I think this is something probably uh, Germany is going to do. Uh, and I think what, he, what she's saying is that you know, all these European countries should, uh, EU countries mostly, should you know, take the same position uh, and, 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 and be the, uh, take the same position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States policy, vis-a-vis -vis the United States pressure. Uh, I think that's what she's really talking about. I don't think she is particularly against deploying uh, equipment from Huawei. I'm, I'm going to agree with John. I mean, <coughs> she's just saying, look, we're not going to be picked off singly, uh, country by country. What we need to do is, is act like the EU, especially in the face of Brexit and a lot of other issues. Remember, Germany, she's the one who can, uh, for her country, least afford to alienate China with the amount of investment and the and sales that they have. This is a country which two-thirds depends on, on uh, exports and things like this. Uh, they need to, ha to have good terms, but the best way for Europe to negotiate with China is as a unified front, not as a separate group of entities or factions. Richard, um, a few months earlier, uh, European politicians uh, released a strategic paper calling China systematic rebel, or not rebel, competitor. I mean, that has caused a lot of policy debates, not only between uh, European uh, policymakers, but back in our country, we have also noticed uh, the change in their tone and wording about what a rising China actually means for the future of European Union in the broad context of not only the transatlantic relationship, but also uh, the triangle relationship a similar one, perhaps, uh, during the Cold War between Europe, the United States, and China. So what do you think? Yes, I, I agree with you. I've been um, surprised uh, by how uh, closely the, the European leaders have followed the Trump administration's uh, harder line towards China. I think you've seen this in many areas. You've seen them turn more skeptical towards the BRI initiative. You've seen the, some of the European navies uh, participate in the freedom of navigation operations off, uh, off uh, uh, China's coast. You've seen uh, China, the NATO and the European governments support the Trump administration's call for China to join the Russia-U.S. 
strategic arms control and, and intermediate range arms control talks. So on a series of issues, the Europeans have, uh, have taken a, very, a much harder line towards China in just the space of a couple years. Uh, Anna, the 1958 National Defense Education Act, let me go back to the issue of science education for Chinese students because mm -hmm. this has a lot to do with the core issue of Huawei. Uh, it is the issue that may somehow divide the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean, Europeans and the United States, uh, focusing on uh, digital leadership uh, in the prospective world. The 1958 National Defense Education Act uh, that Gingrich talks about the stress of the relationship between national defense and education, especially regarding the development of a higher education as a key factor of national security and even life and death. So my question is, how do you view the role of education, especially higher education in national defense? Because this has a lot to do why we face a sharp decline in the number of Chinese students who go to the United States, rather they would opt for the uh, United Kingdom. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not talking about education and ex uh, exchange programs, but let's look at the importance of science education for Chinese students and what it means for U.S. national security. Well, the U.S. is being uh, unjustifiably paranoid here. I mean, if you start looking at the, at the uh, go, go someday, if you have the opportunity, go through and start looking at uh, the IP filings and the names that are on these. This is the, all the new technologies out there. It's not Smith & Jones. It's Patel, it's Wong, all right? These are uh, mainly uh, Asian, some Eastern European. Uh, the fact is that the STEM uh, areas, uh, you know, science and technology, et cetera, et cetera, is dominated by foreign students, not just Chinese, but Indian, and as I said, Eastern European, everybody except Americans who have been turned away from this. So if you start adopting this line that anybody who comes here is an enemy, right? a strange idea given that the United States is a nation of immigrants. Uh, you have this kind of paranoia. You are going to take away your future because the future is going to belong to those who have the human resources to develop all these things. That is why China is continually opening up, trying to bring more of the smarter people here, trying to get them uh, their universities up to par so that they can attract these people. You know, today they were talking about the Yangtze River uh, initiative, which is to, to bind these things together. What do they talk about? They talked about education, and this is here in China. This is the key building block of what it seems. So it's not just defense. You're talking about the future economy here. And th this, this is unfortunately going to not help America. You, you know, the entire American history, the American greatness is built upon this idea that this is a melting pot. This is a place where the best talents of the world will come over and That's and, why and, and uh, scientist uh, Albert <laughs> Einstein exactly. somehow helped to change the course of the Second World War. Right. So American universities started to adopt the German model, right, the Homburg model, uh, doing research. Uh, you know, the United States uh, hired a lot of German scientists during the Second World War. Uh, it, you know, uh, it hired a lot of Chinese students, Indian students these days. So, you know, this is the, this is the very reason why America has been so great so far. And what the Congress is doing right now is going the exact opposite. In my opinion, it's the trying to bring localism to science and technology. They're putting a label on the scientists. Oh, this is Chinese, this is India. This is absolutely, I mean, this, this is the whole idea. Well, is, let's, is let's look at the issue from the American perspective, Anna, uh, John, and Richard. Um, not only had Albert Einstein helped establish the theory of uh, uh, relativity, but a very famous uh, uh, expert of nuclear studies, uh, Mr. Chen Chi Chen, also was also educated in the United States. He, yeah, he, he, was, he, he, he was allowed to come back and he helped uh, build our own uh, A bomb. Uh, this is the gravest mistake. This is the gravest mistake that the United States government ever did, right? He was the youngest tenure professor at MIT, made a great contribution. But that's a huge blessing for building China's national security. Yeah, but I, I don't think you should look at it in nationalist, nationalistic terms. The, the yeah. issue is that intellectual. Um, and scientific advancement is something that should be benefiting the world. It should be controlled where there are dangers and things like this. But exactly what the U.S. is doing is labeling it. They're going, it used to be America was aspirational. You wanted to go to America. You wanted the lifestyle. Now, you know, what do we have? 150 million Chinese go out and 150 million Chinese come back. 
the aspirational part of it isn't there. In fact, if anything, many people are looking at China. Well, the very friendly uh, uh, policy of engagement over the past four decades uh, may have uh, helped uh, disarm the United States about its uh, uh, awareness on communist regime, quote unquote, in, uh, in China. Let me go back to the issue of uh, Chen, Qi, uh, Chen Xuesen, who came back from the United States armed with a pretty advanced knowledge on nuclear uh, weaponry. Um, the reason why I came up with this example is that uh, uh, many policymakers in the United States may have also raised this example to illustrate the catch-22 situation for American educators because uh, they were afraid obsessively that uh, uh, there could be a repeat of this uh, mistake, quote-unquote, on the American side that may have uh, uh, cultivated more talented uh, professionals uh, that may help build up the Chinese military. What do you think of the uh, uh, alleged security concerns from the American perspective, Richard? Those are widespread. I mean, that example is known, but more, there's been more recent focus on uh, some of the cases that occurred in the 90s uh, when there was uh, indications or, or at least allegations that uh, Chinese scholars in some of the U.S. nuclear labs uh, learned things that they went back and aided the Chinese nuclear program. There's the well-known case of the U.S. rocket launchers helping China improve its, its civilian space launch vehicles, which in turn helped this Chinese missile uh, program. Um, more recently, there's concerns of throughout the education establishment about what foreign uh, for, or Chinese included might learn from participating. Um, this is true. This is a, a big concern. Um, but people here understand the advantages of being able to draw on the best of uh, young scholars. If from this the is world true, Richard, excuse me, uh, is that the prelude to decoupling China comprehensively? Um, I'm not sure. It's been a, 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 the, that's been occurring the last couple of years. It's not clear if this will continue uh, in future U.S. administrations. People are, are definitely becoming more cautious in the scientific and technical field. I think, you know, when my, uh, I had family who spent a lot of time in, when they were younger in, in, in uh, Russia, for example, uh, working to, with the, on the Russian space program. They couldn't do that now. Um, and so I think that it's, it's, that may stay, but whether we're going to continue along this path to full decoupling, which is extremely difficult, uh, you know, it depends a bit on the, the outcome of the next year. But I'm afraid election. so many policy moves that have been ruled out by the State Department, the White House, the Pentagon, are actually based on the assumption that China would be a threat. Is that uh, what we call self-fulfilling prophecy? Who can make sure that China will definitely be a threat to the U.S. Well, national security. It, it, what about our public products, public service, and our peacemaking efforts by the PLA? Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't it, know. Is, it, is oh, a, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you treat somebody as, as an enemy, he's going to be an enemy. Systematically demonized and discredited the, 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 China. You know, the, 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 I think the issue here is, is, is paranoia here. I, I can understand that you would like to prevent people from working in defense or industries, but to extend that into the general stand views. These are mathematics, you know, engineering, biotech. biotech. I mean, these are the major scientific researchers benefit the entire mankind, not something to do with missiles or But I'm afraid it's, uh, that, that, that the schools actually focus on ideology, right? Uh, uh, ideology. Exactly. And well, American it's exceptionalism. It's and, and, and this is uh, this is a real problem. I mean, you know, you start looking at Hong Kong. There's a, a different view in terms of where the society and the individual lie. And in the U.S., the individual is a little higher in terms of society, and in Asia, it's a little lower. It is not right or wrong. It is simply different perspectives. And you have the same thing with the ideology. The U.S. is not willing to admit that American exceptionalism is not justified because if, if in fact there are legitimate other systems of government then all of the things that we've done in the, you know, in pr pursuing you know, guys, democracy it, there don't is work. There's no question whatsoever about the uh, political nature of the Chinese Communist Party and its manifesto or vision, whatever. However, you look at, you, you, you do a survey in other countries, in other parts of the world, asking them if China is a communist government. They would say, hey, come on, give me a break. This is a, a cap state capitalism under the communist uh, leadership. Uh, the, you have a different answers, a highly divided spectrum of public opinions regarding 
the nature of the Chinese political institutions. But why do the United States, uh, uh, why does the U.S. government develop such a strong sense of hysteria, as if it's repeating uh, the sense oh, of uh, McCarthyism, yeah. right? Right, right. Well, I think this is exactly what Newt Gingrich's book is all about. He's trying to separate. I mean, it's also coming from uh, Michael Pence's speech. He's trying to separate Chinese people from the, uh, uh, you know, the ruling party, the Communist Party. The Chinese government <laughs> says this is a definitely a futile attempt to separate it's, people it, from Right, from exactly. And I think Newt Gingrich also uh, uh, went a step further. He even, you know, raised this to, you know, he referred to China's old history of expansion, for example, in the Qing Dynasty, China expanded. Uh, I mean, look at how the United States expanded all the way to the Pacific Coast, I guess, uh, speaking of expansion. Uh, and he mentioned, folks, if he was even raised this to the civilization level, I think essentially echoing the view of uh, Samuel Huntington. Here is the centerpiece of the current uh, uh, debates between the United States and China. Most Americans uh, hoped from day one of uh, helping China to modernize, that we would become one of them, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, to mold the Chinese uh, political s system based on the American advocacy for liberal democracy and liberal market economy. But the Foreign Minister and Steve Councillor Wang, you said uh, on many occasions, look, this is uh, ridiculous. Why should you mold our political system and our modernization campaign uh, uh, on your model, uh, with your example in our mind constantly? We have to take a second look at the cultural diversity that may have helped shape the political landscape of the Chinese government and the development, the course of development over the past four decades. What do you think, uh, Anna? Well, ob obviously there are differences in cultures, and they're not going to be overcome. I mean, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you have Samuel Huntington class of cultures, when you have uh, Newt Gingrich trying to resurrect this idea. Um, it, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not going to help things along. I mean, the vilification of China that started in earnest post-2016 continues. Let me go back to Richard on the issue of Hong Kong. Um, here is something that I'm, I'm a little bit uh, confused. President Trump said when he was signing the bill on Hong Kong human rights and democracy, he said this act threatens to interfere with the presidential authority guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution, meaning he definitely has the highest authority in uh, stating the American foreign policy. Uh, this is stipulated clearly in between the lines of the U.S. Constitution. Now, why did he say so at that particular moment when he was about to sign the bill into law? That is a, a almost a, a very frequent statement that presidents make whenever Congress imposes something on them. So President Trump said similar things when the Congress enacted additional sanctions that he didn't want on Russia. Um, they've enact, they've, he, that's often the case that Congress will say, well, Mr., you know, Mr. President, you need to do this, this, and this. And the president will say, okay, I, I'll do this but I think that you're encroaching on my authority and this protects the presidential prerogative uh, for another time. There's always a gray area over what's appropriate for Congress to do and what's appropriate for the president to do and they've tried to work out various veto arrangements uh, and, and, and the courts just won't intervene because it's such a political question. So I, I wasn't surprised by that. I mean, that's, that was sort of common. Okay, thank you very much. In fact, uh, the uh, spokesperson of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, uh, Madame Hua Tengying, said uh, the, the Chinese government has decided to take a series of actions to punish uh, uh, some of the NGOs that uh, allegedly have been involved uh, in the latest uh, turbulence in Hong Kong for the past, past six months. And uh, there would not be any port call by American military vessels uh, in Hong Kong as a result of the current escalation of tensions between the two governments on the territory of Hong Kong. We'll wait to see what's going to happen next. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Goodbye.